This is the second lecture and we will talk about linear spans and linear independence. So to get started, um, we know that like even in R2, right? If you're given this vector and this vector, then for any point, for any point in a plane, you can scale this vector and then you scale this vector and you add up, you get the point, right? So this is some sense called the linear combination, okay? So if V is the vector space over F, over F, then S is non-empty subset of V, and we say that for X and V, it's a linear combination of vectors in S if there exist finite elements in S and Kappa 1 to n and f the field such that it can be expressed as a sum of k1, ki, ui. Okay? So, and we define a span as the set of all linear combinations of vectors in S. And by convention, we define a span of empty set to be the zero vector itself. Okay? So, here's an example. So, We know that, um, let's see, this is a vector space, okay? And S is the set of all one, so these are functions in this set. Then sine x is not in the span of S. So the, the, the field we were we involving is real numbers. And the sine x is not in a span. Why? Because if we have finite elements such that sine x can be expressed as this. Okay, so this function can be expressed as a linear combination of functions. So those are power functions, right? Power functions. Then we take the, the my girl's calling. Then <coughs> we take derivative and then we take it again because sine you take your derivative and then you invert their sine and then you take a derivative again and it comes back to itself but our expression will reduce the number twice we reduce the degree twice right so that's that is the logic and then these two are equal to each other because those two are equal to each other but this has two power that is two less than the one we have well for this we can conclude that a n and a minus one is equal to zero and all the way right we can just we can say that oh a n and a n minus one is zero then we can also we keep doing this thing right we just keep taking derivative two times and all the way down we can say that a i is zero for all i which means that sine x is the constant function well, this is obviously a contradiction, right? Sine x is not a constant function. So which means that sine x is not in the span of this set. Okay? And... Uh, okay, so here's a, here's a theorem. So, V is a vector space, S is a subset of V. And span S is the smallest subspace of V that contains S. So we want to show that for any W subspace and that contains S, then it contains the span, right? This is what it's saying. So it's the smallest subspace of V that contains S. So if you're a subspace that contains S, then you contain span S. That's the, the meaning. So we want to show this. But span S is the smallest subspace of V. So we have to show that it's a subspace of V first. So if S is empty, then span S the trivial subspace. Well done. If S is not empty, we pick an element. And zero times S is zero, right? And zero is in a span S, which means that the span S is not empty, okay? So the span is not empty, and then we're going to use the subspace criterion. So for AB and the span, 
we can express a as a sum and b also as a sum their length might be different the choice of field elements might be different the choice of elements of s might be different too so everything is arbitrary but when we take their sum we just take the sum directly so now here comes the the hard part if there's duplicates between the field elements right if one of ui is equal to some kj or this duplicates and element from s then we use the associativity law right we group them and then we use that f and v is a closed under addition to express the sum as something a i v i over one to p okay so p is greater than or equal to m n yeah and for i all the a i is in f and v is in s which means that a plus b is in the span right by definition okay so it's closed under addition now we want to say that's closed under scalar multiplication for a in the span we write a as this then lambda a is basically this in the span so we're done which means that span is a subspace of v okay now if w is a subspace and it contains s we pick a in the span then we can express it like this and then we use the fact that s is a s is a sub subset of w right then if those are all in w then those are in w which means that a is in w so span s is in w right it's a vector space over f then we have this is true then we're done okay so we have a new definition a subset of v s we say s spans v if the span of s is equal to v so here's an example f is a field right we define a matrix e i j such that only the i j entry is one and all others is zero then you can say that oh the span of all such e i j is equal to this yeah of course because given a matrix a can be expressed as this sum right which means that it spans this it's the standard matrix units more examples if s1 is a subset of s2 then the span is also a subset of s2 well this the proof is trivial okay so i just skip it okay now we come to linear independence and linear dependence like linear dependence means some redundancy right so if we have this vector and this 45 degree vector and this vector then um for a vector something like this right we can do this we can do this and then we do this or we can just do this and this so there's like a redundancy right so to describe such redundancy we come up with a definition called linearly dependent so for s being a subset of v we say s is linearly dependent if there exist finitely distinct vectors and elements from field such that at least one is non-zero which means that not all of them are zero such that their linear combination is equal to the zero vector if no such finite subset of s exists then we say s is linearly independent okay if no such finite subset exists so here is a criterion for being linearly independent or is like a like a characterization of being linearly independent because simply saying the negation of the statement is not clear enough we need some statements we need some properties to make this thing even like more clear and more intuitive independent means no redundancy right okay so just first look at our statements this is equal to s they're distinct and field elements if their linear combination is zero then M, it implies that all the coefficients are zero and the statement c is that if it's in the span then there exists a unique 
it's unique. This means that there exists unique. Okay, there exists a unique set of distinct vectors and non-zero scalars. So those are all unique such that x is the linear combination of them. So my proof is b to c, c to a, a to b. So a to b, b to c, c to a. But I'm doing b to c first. And it's kind of long. Okay, so b to c. Okay, we're going to use this to prove this. For x is in a span, we write x as a such that we require each field element is non-zero. Because otherwise, why would you add them? We just take off all the zero elements, right? We just say that, oh, they're all non-zero, okay? They're all non-zero, and all the si are distinct. And it's fine to make this requirement, okay? Now, we want to argue that the expression is unique, right? So say if we have another expression, so for 1 to m, their ca kappa, these are u's. Those are si's, there's a s prime i's, such that blah blah, okay? Now, then we take, we subtract them, right? Because x subtract x, we got 0. And it's going to be equal to some aivi from 1 to n plus n. Or ai, so for the first n elements, it's just, it's just kappa i's. And for the rest, m elements, there are ui's. A negative ui. Negative ui. Size as premise, yeah. We just do this. So, if all the vectors, all the vi are all distinct, well, which means that they add up zero, right? They already add up to zero. And if all of them are distinct, all the oh, no, all the vi are distinct, then it says that all the ai's are equal to zero. Well, this will imply that all the kj and all the ui's are zero but we require that they're all non-zero. So here's a contradiction. Now, so, so there's duplicates between vi's, right? There's duplicates between, between them, but all the si's, like all the si's are themselves distinct, right? All the, all the, they're like themselves distinct. So the only duplicate possible is between one element from this and one element from this collection so which means that exists ij such that si is equal to s prime j now we eliminate duping duplicates by using regroup right we group them so if there's duplicates then we just use distributive law right we use the distributive law so zero is equal to some biwi and we define a set B is that we define a set B is all the coefficients, all the coefficient B i such that is equal to some is equal to some difference between the field elements, the coefficients. Okay? And this should be a subset of B1 to BK, right? By definition. Right? Now if B is a properly contained in all the coefficients then some bj is either kr or uq right so some of the bi's is either be all this or this they're left out but by using b right bj is equal to zero then we should make our this or this is zero which is a contradiction because we assume that they're all non-zero so we need to have b is equal to b1 to bk. Well, this means that all the vectors are the same. And n is equal to m because 
they're the same set so thus they have the same cardinalities right well this means that we have this right which means that ki is equal to ui so the expression is unique so b to c we have done and now we want to show that c implies a so we show that oh a you're in the so we pick an element and a span and all the ui's are non-zero and i psi is distinct and the expression is unique okay suppose for a contradiction suppose for a contradiction that s is dependent then we know that there exists finitely distinct vectors in s and also elements in kappa at least one is non-zero such that the linear combination is zero since the expression is unique right so we this expression is unique we're given and is unique by c right we are we assume c is true then we subtract we do the subtraction we got this and it's again equal to x and equal to this okay so from here let's just keep going so we do some algebra with this this is equal to some something like this now if all the vi are distinct if all the vi are distinct then for the coefficients you have So this is not rigorous enough. It should be v's because they're all distinct, right? Is equal to all the generating vectors s one to s n. Okay, but oh, those two sets are the same, but with different cardinality. So we get a contradiction. So which means that there exist duplicates between vectors. Now we write it like this, and we define b as usual as above. Now, if we're given this, okay, and there exist duplicates. So listen carefully. So if all, so there's duplicates, but the number of duplicates, we have to discuss them, right? So. If there's SI or a YI, both of SI and YI that are left out, then it means that W1 to WK has bigger cardinality than B1 to BN. Okay, so my comparison here makes no sense. Okay? So let's just let's just I was just talking about it because if there's leftovers, so if they're duplicate, we just group them. And if there's leftovers, since we have the expression is unique, right? Since so in a set of vectors, and also set of all SIs are the same, but we have different cardinalities, right? Now, if, if all the yi's goes into some si's, say like that, then if the vectors has duplicates, then the scalar must, must, we use the distributive law, right? We use the distributive law. Well, this will require that the kappa i is to be zero, right? This will require the kappa i is to be zero. <coughs> but we assume that kappa is non-zero, so we get a contradiction anyways. Like, or we can argue by like, oh, this must be n, right? And b i should be some u i's. And wi should be some si's, right? We have this unique expression. But <coughs> m, oh my god, sorry, m. Oh, 
Well, for with that being said, we can't have any of those left out, right? Otherwise, the length, the length of the summation cannot be. So all the y's goes into the si's, and all the cap i's goes into the ui's. We require all the linear combination the elements are distinct, so we can change this to si's. Right, so all the y's are some elements of s. And the beta is gonna be some some difference between ui and ki. But hbi could be ui minus ki, or it could just be ui itself, right? So this absorbs all the yi's, right? Well, if we have this summation, and this should be equal to what? Right? So which means that <coughs> it means that oh and then you subtract the we take their subtraction, right? Then we have that oh like like when we subtract them, we see that the kappa i's must be zero. But we require that at least one of kappa is non-zero. So we get a contradiction. Okay. And for A implies B, we use contrapositive and it is trivial. Okay. We use contrapositive. Then this basically means S is dependent. And we have finished the proof. So C implies A might not be that clear, okay? Because oh, we we take this, and we we agree that we argue that we must have duplicates between the S I and Y I's, and we also know that and all the Y I's must all goes into the S I's. So the collection of Y I is a subset of S I's, and. When we do that, we use uh, the distributive property, right? We can group their scalar elements. And when we group their scalar elements, right, it's going to be just like this, right? B-I-S-I. -I, where some B-I is some kappa Q minus U-R, right? or u minus kappa, but no matter what, anyways. Then we compare this side. They have same length, they have um, same vectors, and then between among them, you take subtraction again. Well, from here, we can say that, oh, we have a linear combination of zero, right? We have a linear combination of zero, and because Okay, we have this one. This is unique, so all the bi's should be all the ui's. Well, this means that all the kappa i should vanish, but at least one is non-zero. Yeah, so it's kind of abstract, right? I'm sorry for the, the confusion, but it is really that like that. Okay, so here's an example. If zero vectors in the set, then it automatically dependent because by b we have one times zero is zero, that implies that one is equal to zero. And here's a contradiction. Okay. By B of the criteria. Okay, so we have one more theorem to go. So if V is a vector space and is a subset that is linearly independent, we let S, X, B, and V, but not an S. Then the following are equivalent. So A is that you adjoint x you join s with x as linearly and linearly dependent that is equivalent to x being in the span okay so s is given depend independent but as you put x that becomes dependent is equivalent of saying x is in the span so we go this direction first so if this is linearly dependent well, this means that 
We have distinct mono zero equal to zero. Note note that right because we must include x. We must include x. Otherwise it will violate the uh, the the setting that s is linearly independent. So we must include x in the linear linear combination. Right? And we note that x1 is not zero, otherwise all of them are zero. Because x if a k kappa one is zero, this vanishes, then this is zero. But s is linearly independent. And this implies that all the k2 to kn is zero, right? So if kappa one is non zero, we can divide them because we're in the field. We can divide non zero elements, right? Then we cap this, then x is in the span. Okay, so other way, if you're in the span and s is a learning independent, then we use part c. Then <coughs> we know that x subtract those s equal to zero. Well, this implies that it's dependent by definition because we have scalars that's not all zero because we have one of the scalar is equal to one. And all of them are distinct because them are distinct and x is in v but not in s. So they're all distinct. Okay, so this concludes the second lecture and we'll talk about tutorials next time.